And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. So glad to have you. Hope all of y'all are nice and safe and toasty and the ice is melting off around your house. Um, we're not going back down below freezing tonight, so it should have significant ice melt tonight. And we'll see what the um, next couple of days bring as, uh, in regards to more snow. And um, we trust there'll be no, it'll just be snow and no ice. And um, hallelujah. So that's what we're looking for. Um, you know, 15 to 20 inches of snow would be fine with me. Um, I love snow. Uh, if you don't like snow, um, I love you, but I love my snow and we don't get a we don't get a lot of it here. And I can understand it. If you lived up in Maine somewhere and you got 70 inches a year, I, I could get it, but, uh, we get it, you know, five inches every three years. So, um, just accommodate us snow lovers. Praise God. Um, God is good. And uh, we're, we're going down the home stretch on our remote sessions. Um, we trust that um, next Wednesday night will be our last one. And if all goes well, we should, we should be um, in, in our place by the last Sunday of this month. And uh, that, would, that would end our um, remote only. How about that? Uh, we will still we will still broadcast, but uh, for those who can't make it out, particularly like during weeknights and stuff, but want to come to the services, um, praise the Lord. And um, but we are ready to roll. We're on lesson nineteen, and uh, once again, uh, just for those who may have uh, be joining us kind of late in the game, uh, the Bible in the light of our redemption by E. W. Kenyon. You can pick this up on. Um, Amazon.com or at Walmart.com um, for the cost of somewhere plus or minus fifteen dollars. Uh, we are on less than nineteen, but there's like thirty-seven, and we've we've kind of come through the Old Testament. We are now moving into the real exciting uh, part of this, and um, as we move into the you know to the incarnate one, the life of Christ, and then move into uh, redemption, applying its application to us. Glory to God. So let's look in here. McKeon states that um, in the last study, we talked about the need, man's need for the incarnation and the promise that the Father had given concerning the coming one. And um, when the full, Paul uh, Kenyon talks about when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son in the incarnation, according to Galatians 4.4. 4. Now, when Christ was born, came into the earth 2,000 years ago, it was a perfect time. So this is this was the fullness of the time. Um, Greece had cre had um, given the world basically the second language of the world. Uh, most people still spoke their uh, indigenous uh, languages, but they also spoke Greek. Okay, and um, and so we and we have there in in this Greek. Um, this particular uh, time frame of Greek, it's not like modern Greek, it's, it's a different version. Kind of like, you know, we don't speak Elizabethan English, but we speak English, okay? And, uh, you know, Elizabethan is very poetic, very flowery, da-da-da-da-da. Um, <clears throat> but this language was beautiful, flexible, uh, very expressive, um, probably the most the world had ever known, at least up until that time. Um, and think about that. That's why we have like the Bible versions, like the Amplified Bible, um, because it takes maybe in some cases three, four, five English words to fully translate the meaning of some Greek single words. Uh, we talk about agape, uh, the word love. Well, it, love doesn't give you the full import of that word. I mean, there are actually four Greek words for love. Uh, storge, eros, um, phileo, and agape. And each one of those needs more than one word uh, and, and adjectives to give full descript to that so that we understand it. And so this Greek language was powerful. Uh, we also talk about like pericle, the comforter. Well, it means comforter, helper, strengthener, standby, advocate, um, teacher. You know, it's more than simply the comforter. And that, that one Greek word conveys all that meaning. 
And so at this time, when the fullness time came, uh, we had a language that was so powerful that it, 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 this, the breadth of its expression covered so much. Think about being at the title. I use the term Christ. I'm sorry, comforter, paraclete, and have all that description of the Holy Spirit with one word. So the language of the day, uh, as I said, the second language of the world, uh, you know, like today, really the second language of the world is, is English. And what it's been so since World War II. Up until then, it was French. Um, French had become the second language of the world. After World War II, uh, the e English became the second language of the world. Or we might even want to say American. Um, the, the British call our, our English American. They don't call it English. It's American. But it is the second language of the world. And so Greece had created a language that, that was spoken throughout the what we call the known world and enabled communication with everybody, very powerful, expressive communication. So when the writing of the Gospels took place uh, um, and translation of the of the Hebrew and to the Septuagint, uh, we have a language that, that is powerful in relaying um, the, the heart of God, the mind of God, the counsel of God, and that holy men wrote as the Spirit moved on them. Praise the Lord. Also, um, with this language, uh, the political power of the world was Rome. And they, they were great road builders. They built, you know, they built, uh, and they built infrastructure um, all over the, the, the world of, of their territories. The Middle East being the crossroads of the trade routes. And the Romans built super roads uh, so that their armies could go and, and you know, um, keep secure the Roman Empire. There are still Roman roads and aqueducts uh, in, today in the world. I'm trying to think what city. I don't know if it was it, uh, if it was Abila, Abila, or where they had the Roman aqueduct. I'm trying to remember where we saw it in Spain, um, but you know the aqueduct was still there. Amazing, you know. I can't remember if it was outside of Madrid, if it was in Abila, but you know the, there was a Roman aqueduct, two thousand years old, sitting up there, you know. Roads. Uh, there are places where the Roman roads are still uh, there. So they they built that infrastructure. Well, the uh, uh, Segovia. Okay. All right. And where was Segovia? I forgot where that was. It was in our travels when we were in Spain. Hallelujah. We we went to see it. Janie had the Lonely Planets uh, Europe. Uh, book Western Europe uh, from by Lonely Planet, and we did everything it said to do. She already mapped it out when we got there, so we watched Rick Steves, and we've always been where he's told us to go. If he's in a country we went, we've been to, we've always been where he told us to go. You know, praise the Lord. We're like, cool, we went there. You know, we could have done this show. Hallelujah. And um, so, so shipping lines have been established for the East. Trade routes have been established. So when the gospel began to be proclaimed, there was already, you know, we didn't have, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have, you know, mass communication. They had verbal communication and so forth. But the, the ability to uh, preach the gospel all over the world, go into all the world, the infrastructure for the pro propagating of the gospel throughout the earth was there. And Christ came in the fullness of time. Hallelujah. Can you say glory to God? You know, uh, I guess a, a happy thumbs up will work. Amen. Universal man at this time had a heart cry for incarnation. Um, God had brought about the conditions to, to get the gospel out. The news of redemption could go to all the places. Um, but on the same exact other hand, we're talking about one of the most perverse, dark, evil ages of humanity was during that time. The Romans were very perverse. And, um, you know, you, you can read about that kind of thing and the Catamites and that so forth. And, um, you know, you could do studies on it. Uh, but it was, very, it was an extremely perverse civilization. And... Um, 
And so you had, you had extreme darkness and um, to be as in, and it amazes me how oftentimes ed, super intelligentsia education is extremely dark. And the reason for that is, is um, man begins to worship man. They begin to think that they are above their station, as it were, that they are God because of their intelligence. And they, they don't need a creator. They don't need a God. They don't need a higher power. And then it becomes a, a moralistic, you know, um, the only morals are what's right for you at the moment. That is your morality. And um, yet there's still a hope, I mean, a, a cry and a longing for the incarnation to be one with God. Um, the hope of Redeemer is, is the very atmosphere of the age. Jewish prophecy that had been silent for four centuries has awoken with the expectation of a Messiah. Um, even pagans were yearning for deliverance. Remember, the wise men of the East came, and they represented the universal Eastern longing for a Redeemer. The eyes of the world and its expectation were turned towards Palestine. In the fullness of the time, Jesus Christ, uh, who was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the response to the age-long heart cry of universal man under the bondage of spiritual death. What? The emptiness of man's heart had been there since the fall. And man's inner longing was reconciliation with God, which could only take place in the incarnation. Only God really knew what man, um, man's need demanded. And only God could meet the demand. It was and could only be the incarnation. Uh, man has hungered instinctively for an incarnation, Kenya states. Um, there are three things a natural man has desired. He desires fellowship with God, um, desires to possess the life of God, and has desired the strength of God. Primitive man has hunger for incarnation. Every ancient human religion has tried to answer that cry. H. Clay Trumbull in his book, The Blood Covenant, um, talks about um, this from his book. I'm not going to read this excerpt. You can read it. It is from his book, The Blood Covenant. Um, and as he, as he covers the travels of, uh, of Stanley and Livingston across the continent of Africa. And uh, I believe... Um, I can't remember if it was Stanley or Livingston, cuts 26 covenants at least with tribal chiefs and leaders um, throughout, the, throughout the continent. And um, each and he learned more and more about God. And so as, as Trumbull was studying the travels, he began to see the significance of the blood covenant and its primitive rite as a, a watered-down version of the table of Christ in the blood covenant that God has with man. Hallelujah. They would drink the blood of the sacrifices to God, hoping for an incarnation, a, a oneness with God. The, the, the gods, you know, the, the false gods, obviously, but the gods of the Greeks and the Romans. And if I'm not mistaken, the Roman gods and the Greek gods are essentially the same. They just go by different names. Okay. Uh, they're basically the same gods. Just go by mistake, by different names. And they were supposed to be an incarnation. They were to be, they were be, they were um, God men. Um, they were immortal, superior human beings. Okay. And many times the kings of ancient civilization the civilizations were believed to be descendants of the gods, and they were worshipped as incarnation. I remember when I went to Bangkok to teach in the Bible school, uh, the overseer of the school said, "Do not." say anything negative about the king because the people consider him a deity and they will kill you. You can't, you can preach Jesus. You can preach King of Kings. You can preach Lord of Lords, but don't say anything uh, contrary, anything evil, anything bad about the king because that he, he to the people is a deity. So, you know, preach the truth. Just don't say anything about him. And let, let revelation come to them. 
Hallelujah. <clears throat> and even today, we hunger for incarnation. Education has not eliminated from man's spirit this hunger. Now, I am not anti-education, but I am telling you, you have to be careful with education. Because man's mind will begin to, out, to reason things um, and reason out God. That's why the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. You cannot reason faith. And in most cases, the educated mind is a carnal mind. And that is enmity, set in opposition to God. It's not subject to the laws of God, and neither indeed can be. So it doesn't mean you don't get educated. You don't get, uh, we like to say it this way. Do not educate your mind at the expense of your spirit. Okay. And just because scientists say it's so, don't make it so. Remember, they used to say the world was flat. Well, uh, we know better than that now. Well, they didn't back then. And I don't know if you know it or not. There is now a new movement called the Flat Earth Society. I kid you not. They actually believe that all the pictures of the spheres and stuff is a falsehood that the earth is really flat. Go figure. Okay. You just never know what people are going to come up with. Do you? Now, if there's a way to put a shake in my head out there, y'all put a couple of shake in my heads, you know, or the, the, the forehead, the hand, uh, uh, palm to the forehead. Okay. What? what? Face bump. Okay. Face palm. Yep. Palm. What did I say? Bump. Bump. Oh. The present hunger. So, um, every modern religion desires incarnation. Today, uh, people who claim to be incarnate uh, receive a large following. Now, you have these people who come along. Now, what possesses 800 people to drink strychnine laced Kool Aid? You know, Jim Jones um, was a presented himself as a Messiah figure. I mean, and he's not the only one that's ever done it. Um, many others have done that kind of thing and, and get all kinds of people. And, and there's usually some type of physical perversion going on in these cults. We call them pseudo-Christian, false Christian cults um, who present themselves as God's chosen one. And then just let me tell you, there is not a man walking the earth that is a chosen or previously walked the earth that is the chosen one of God except Jesus Christ. And it wasn't that he was just the chosen one. He was God manifest in the flesh. He was the incarnation. Glory to God. And uh, But we have people all, all over, you know, claiming to be Christ, basically. Now, they may not come out and say it in those terms, but everything they do um, presents that. And, I, and I, I warn any, anyone, if you're anyone, if you're following a, a group, a man, to the point you cannot be, you cannot um, look at scripture and see that they may be wrong, they may be in ex excess, you're in danger. If they declare themselves infallible, run. The sooner, the sooner the, a, a man declares himself infallible, it's time to pack up and hit the road. And don't you look back no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack and, don't, and Jackie. And don't look back no more. I got to do it. What you say now? Hit the road. All right, I'm sorry. I couldn't stop without getting that part. Amen. Um, come on, guys. I need, I need some support out there. Hallelujah. You know, no man... Is God no man's infallible? I, I remember watching Brother Hagin. Everybody said Brother Hagin was a prophet. He was a prophet of God. But I've seen him minister to people and say, "Now 
I believe the Lord's showing me da 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 da. And then he said, now I'm, I might miss it. He said, if I missed it, don't you don't you act on it? Don't you do a thing with it? You know, make bear witness with your heart. And, and he sometimes ask them, now am I right? And they say, yes sir, yes sir, you're right. You know. But I, you know, I, I've I've seen him do that. You know, in other words, I'm a man. I can miss it. I can be wrong. And if I am, don't you, and, and you know it, don't you act on it. Okay? Praise the Lord. Some, there are certain modern cults. Um, yeah, yeah. And he, Kenya also says, it's not just the ignorant that get swooped up by the uh, God, you know, the, the God figure, the man who, or woman who declares himself to be deity. It's very educated people. The educated can be swept away too. I mean, I, I look at um, um, Dianetics or whatever, you know, where a guy, um, you know, what they, they call it um, Scientology. It was made up. The guy started writing this stuff and made it up in like the 70s. Ron right, yeah, L. Ron Hubbard. That's how I remember those commercials. And people started following it. And he, he just flat out made it up. And very educated and very affluent people are all caught up in that, that thing. So um, don't think it's just a bunch of ignorant po co country folk out there. You got no no way of, uh, of uh, knowing any better who follow that. It, it's very, very highly educated people. Why? Because it's appealing to the carnal side of man and not to the spirit. Our spirits bear witness with our spirit that we're the sons of God. God's spirit bears witness with our spirit. Hallelujah. And um, we see from time to time that um, from the time man dies spiritually until present day, man has hungered for union with deity for a God man. And this is the problem. You have people longing for it. And in the church, we need to be careful. We need to stop looking for the next hook, the next cool thing that'll get people into our churches. Because it's it's not a, about, as Whitney Houston said in the um, um, Sister Act, butts in the seat. Richard, Richard not Whitney Houston, Whoopi Goldberg in the Sister Act said um in the whole idea of butts in the seats you know because they were taking um traditional church hymns and putting them to um you know nightclub style music the um the supremes <laughs> and it was filling the building up well we want people in the church but we want people in the church that are born again hello to, to disciple amen and we got to watch for the narratives. We got to watch out for the narratives that will sacrifice truth and appeal to the carnal mind. And I think that's one of the dangers of the seeker sensitive message is we begin to appeal to their fleshly desires of religion and not a personal intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ submitting and yielding completely and wholly to his will, purpose, and plan. You know, so we, we try to make it comfortable. We don't want to preach sin, you know, that this is sin, and that you need to repent from it and turn from it and be born again. We don't want to preach repentance. Very interesting. Um, one of the six, um, I think it's six, doctrines of the church that Paul writes in the book of Hebrews one of those is a repentance from sin. Hello. Join me, if you will, in the, I believe, the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Everybody say, I love God. Come on, guys out there. Y'all with me? Yeah, 
didn't say repentance. From, okay, it says this. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. Listen, the first thing he says, of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. The doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. All right. And so here we have it. Repentance from dead works is a principal doctrine of Christ. And we got churches who don't want to talk about it. Why? Because we're catering to the carnal man. But see, Christ came to redeem us spiritually, and there needs to be an incarnation, and we don't need to offer a substitute. We don't need tofu gospel. Hello? Soybean that tastes like steak. What's that? Beyond gospel. Beyond gospel. Beyond. Beyond. <laughs> or the impossible gospel. <laughs> okay. We don't need beyond gospel or impossible gospel. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you something. When I hunker down on steak, I want it to be steak. I don't want some chemically, uh, genetically altered soybean turned into cow. Hello, it's better for you. I cannot believe that the manipulation of something to the point it has texture, looks like, tastes like, smells like something that it's not is better for you than the real opinion. Okay? Okay? Um, we don't need soybean gospel, tofu gospel. We need the real gospel. And it doesn't need to appeal to the mind of man. Remember, Paul did write and say that the carnal mind's enmity against God. Okay? So we need to appeal to the heart of man. We need to give the heart of man what he desires. That emptiness, and man has searched for it. Remember Solomon talked about the vanity of vanities and how many ways he searched looking for God. And he looked for it in wives and concubines and in this and in that. I mean, the man had so many women... Uh, uh, he he could only see have a date with each one once every three years, or so. Bunch of women hanging around. I don't know how many cat fights they had there. It could be a bunch. That's not even a harem. I don't know what you'd call that. That many women hanging around. Um. Man needed the incarnation. Man needed to be reconciled to God. The years of separation between God and man had left him with a, uh, in a world ruled by Satan, and he did not by nature know the Creator. And that's why we come up with all this stuff. Well, I believe that I can worship God in the trees. That I'm with the flowers, I'm with God. Go to uh, the Musée de l'Ange in uh, Paris and go to the Monet section and look at his art. You were not with Monet. You saw a work that he did. Well, you were not with him. You couldn't have a conversation with him. And if you did and he talked back, there's a real trouble. Okay. Now, is it orange where his stuff always is, or orange, or is that what just on on loan there? Lingerie is okay. Yeah, it was on loan to the uh, Musée Lange when we were there because uh, they were remodeling the other museum. They had put they had loaned a lot of his works over there, um, so people could still see them. Um, but you can't say you were with Monet. You're not with God because you're in a flower bed. He created it for you. But it's, you know, for humanity to enjoy, but it's not him. Philosophers have uh, sought in vain to know his nature. The incarnation of Jesus Christ has given to the world a true knowledge of the nature of God. From the time that man died spiritually, God and man have been separated. Spiritually, dead man cannot know God as his creator without a direct revelation from him. And man had rejected revelation. This is where education came in. Man wanted to know by his senses 
what reality was. If he couldn't see it, he couldn't believe it. If he couldn't touch it, it wasn't real. If he couldn't taste it, if he couldn't hear it, so forth, if it wasn't his senses, then it wasn't real. A nation's conception of God determines the worship in life. When we look at America, particularly the past, oh, 50, 60 years, um, and we could probably, you know, post-World War II, the baby boomers, particularly moving into the... Um, the hippie age of the 60s and 70s, the drug age, people started experimenting with drugs to find a deeper meaning of life. And, you know, they became anti-capitalists. Now, just, just so you know, all the anti-capitalists of the 60s are the Wall Street brokers of today. Okay? They kind of did a Buddha thing. Now, if you don't know this, the original Buddha was skinny. He thought the way to enlightenment was to starve himself. And he almost starved himself to death. And he figured that wasn't it. So he, figured, he, he began to eat because, you know, the only way to enlightenment must be how much you ate. And he, now we have fat Buddhas. So we went from skinny Buddha to fat Buddha. Okay. We went from anti-capitalist to the extreme capitalist. Um, MacArthur said when, when Japan surrendered, give me 10,000 missionaries and we'll take this island for God. And some bozo back in America says, no, we don't want to mess with their culture. <coughs> we don't want to do anything. And, and so the Japanese thought that our the success of our nation was capitalism. And they began, and then they beat our pants off at it. They would they'd be serving Jesus Christ right now with that same kind of vigor had we sent missionaries. But some, somebody was in place by the devil to keep that from happening. Um, the blindness of man's heart, the veil over his eyes, uh, has given him a false impression of God. We have the, you know, we had the big guy upstairs. God's going to get you for that. You boom, lightning's going to get you. God's going to strike you down. He's mean. He's he's the he's untouchable. He's unreachable. Anything and everything but who God is. And that is because of blindness of the heart and the rejection of revelation. Okay? And we reason things out. Even Israel, who had the clearest revelation of God that anybody could have, did not understand God. Their perception of God was like that. He was a Pharisee. Proud, bitter, unkind, arrogant, and self-seeking. Couldn't even recognize when Jesus showed up. In John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And we gazed upon his glory, a glory as the only begotten from his father. Uh, the expanded um, Bible, or it's the Rotherham translation is what it is. That's, that was his translation, um, the expanded Bible. And um, so Rotherham says he pitched his tent. We, we talked about that before. They tabernacle dwelt, tented among us. It has been our tendency, the thing of Christ coming to the earth as a man, listen, we dwell on his self-denial, his sufferings, um, and coming to earth from glory. Yet, as we know him better, we believe that it was joy to him who loved man so much and desired so much fellowship to dwell on earth among men that he might give to alienated man who had never known his creator a true concept of God. Remember, Hebrew says that Jesus being the uh, express image of his person. One translation says the outshining, the outraying of his personage. The exact representation of who the Father is. Christ realized and appreciated the, this phase of his ministry. John says that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he both, he hath, um, declared him when Jesus came. Now remember, Jesus said, "I only." You remember, they said, uh, "Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us." And Jesus said, "If I've been with you so long, you don't understand yet. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father." Glory to God. His life was different from the lives of the great philosophers and religious teachers before him. 
Our modern philosophers sit down and talk about why do we call the grass green? Who cares? It's a name. It's a descript we have given it that allows us to know that this particular shade that we see with our eyes, uh, we can call it green and everybody knows what we're talking about. Why do we call the sky blue? That's not deep. That's stupid. People see that and go, oh, how deep he is. He's on drugs. This stuff came out of the drugs. Um, people had come as seekers of the, of the truth. He came as the revelation of the truth. He revealed the creator to be a God of love, a holy God who could be approached. John the Baptist, in all of his strength, sternness, and um, the way he preached, when he came into the presence of Jesus, fell back saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. This man, the best of men, felt his deep need in the presence of this incarnate one, yet the most sinful of men felt drawn to him. They weren't repulsed by him. They were drawn to him. Publicans and sinners drew near to him and were uh, pleased to sit and eat with him. They weren't afraid of his holiness. They were drawn by his love. Children sat upon his knees. Jesus did something that, that, that religions don't do, and made a, that is they made a place for children. Except you become as one of these, you have no, no part in the kingdom. Hallelujah. God loves children. We even sing, remember we sang the song growing up, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Hallelujah. Uh, our present day appreciation of children. Now, there's a lot in society, societally, uh, in ages gone by, children had no standing anywhere. They were just a fact of procreation. They had nothing until they became man and became useful, became adults and became useful. Um, they had no standing. Even women gained standing through, through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, you can go into heathen nations, and I'm going to tell you, women are treated um, like slaves. Uh, I'll never forget um, Ed Elliott uh, sharing with us uh, in one of his sermons years ago, that they were in Africa, and, and Ed was in Africa for a number of years and, and, and saw hundreds of thousands of people come to Jesus Christ and those evangelistic crusades. And uh, But one night, um, you know, they would go into churches too, but then they would go hold the big crusades. And, um, and one night they were, they were sharing with pastors, or, or, you know, and, and there was a, an American, African-American had gone with them on this particular trip. And um, after being there for a couple of weeks and seeing how the women in that area were treated, you know, the man sat around as a king. The women would walk five miles each way for a bucket of water and then take care of the man like he was a god. This, this, this young girl was at the altar crying out, thank you, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, that you, and... Uh, so they went over because she was just screaming out. And they got there and just, sat, and just sat there and listened to her for a little while. Thank you that my ancestors come as slaves to America. Thank you that they paid the price so that I can live in the freedom and liberty that I had today because my life would have been this had I been born here. See, where the gospel hadn't been, they were treated with, with no dignity and no worth. Where the gospel has come, women have been elevated. Women have been lifted up. Hallelujah. That's what the power of gospel does. Praise God. He's a God of love. Jesus came to show by his life and by his words what the heart of the universe is like. Creation itself can only bring us the revelation that there is an omnipotent God. He's all powerful. And so the actual creation itself doesn't reveal the, the heart of God. It just shows us his acts. It cannot, be, it cannot reveal its nature to us. We do not know the omnipotence of our, our creator. That would frighten us. We do not know the omniscience of him. We wouldn't understand it. And we do not ask to understand his omnipresence. 
Your imagination can't grasp it. What do we ask for? To know his nature. His attitude towards us. Is he indifferent towards us as humans? Or is he interested in us? We now know what God is like. We know his attitude toward us because he dwelt among us as a man. God is Christ. Now, this is like he, he, he says, God is like Christ. The heart of the creator is the heart that broke on the cross. When a Yale professor said one time, the question to my mind is not the divinity of Jesus, but whether God is like Jesus. <clears throat> and he is. Jesus was God. God is Jesus. Okay. He's the second person of the Godhead. I only do those things as I see my father. He that seen me has seen the father. Okay. Too often we talk about God in terms of aloof, separate, disconnected. But Jesus came to reveal the heart of the father that touches, that heals, that delivers, that has compassion. Hello. That restores, that reconciles. So we look at the life and the ministry and the teachings of Jesus and he reveals the nature of the father of God. Is it not wonderful that man lived among us in such a manner that we can think of God, we can think in terms of this man, Jesus? You can transfer every moral quality of Jesus to God, and it does not in any measure lower our conception of God. Actually, it expands it and increases our conception of God and gives us insight into who God is. Actually, on the contrary, the higher conception that we can have of him is that he is like Christ. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to show us the Father. If we try to think of God in any other way than that of Christ, we lower our concept of him. We only see him as a separate, unreachable, untouchable, tyrannical master, which is everything but who God is. The life of Christ is written across the human realm of ours uh, that God is love. Hallelujah. Not that God has love, but he is love. Nothing can erase that. The heart cry of man for incarnation has been answered in Jesus. Hallelujah. God was manifest in the flesh. God lived as a man among us, and we now know his nature. We find him in Christ to be all that we want him to be. We want a loving, caring, um, compassionate God. His compassion is revealed in his grace. Hallelujah. God, Christ not only revealed him to us as God of love, but also as a father. Whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. No other religion has ever had a father God. What excitement has caused among the Jews when Christ called God his father? And then they sought to kill him because by calling God his father, he made himself equal with God. Now in John 14 and 26, 46, 7, 29, 8, 18 and 10, 15, we know that the revelation of the Father God to man was the center around which Christ moved. We look at the life of this incarnate one. He has become man to the fullest sense of the word. Yet wherein did he differ from other men? The difference between his lives and the lives of those around him did not lie in the fact that he was any less human. It lie in the fact he did not belong to the realm of spiritual death. And in John 5, 26, it says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Christ was the first man from the time of man's treason at the fall of Adam who had been able to make a statement like that. He, start, he stated that he possessed the life of God. Because of that, Satan had no dominion over Christ. Christ was not spiritually dead. He walked, in our one, he walked in oneness with the Father God. He lived in the realm of omnipotence. Disease had no dominion over the body of Christ because disease was a child of spiritual death. 
For the same reason, the body of Christ was not mortal. When he walked the earth, he was not immortal. He wasn't mortal. Because mortal means death doomed. Man's body became death doomed when he died spiritually. Spiritual death had never entered the spirit of Christ. Therefore, as he walked the earth, his body was not subject to death. The body of this incarnate one was neither mortal nor immortal. He possessed a perfect eternal human body. The kind of body that Adam had before he died spiritually. It was impossible for man to have taken the life of Christ before his time had come. On the cross, Christ died physically because he had first died spiritually. When he, made, when he was made sin for us, his spirit went a and underwent a change. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he who knew no sin became sin, that we might be, or, or was made to be sin, but to be is not in the Greek. So he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And his, when he died on the cross spiritually, uh, his body became mortal like Adam's when he died spiritually. How? Because he allowed sin to overtake him. And then he was judged. The Hebrew word for death in Isaiah 53, 9 is plural. Showing Christ's death on the cross. And if you look there, it says in Isaiah 53, I'll read that to you real quick. It says in Isaiah 53, 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. But the, the Hebrew is death, plural, because he had done no violence, neither was any uh, deceit in his mouth. And so um, he, he suffered the deaths to take man's place. First a spiritual death, then a physical death as man's substitute. In the life of this man, we see the life that the Father God had planned for man. How utterly free and rich and full was the life of this incarnate one. As a man, he walked the earth free from Satan's dominion. And because of an incarnation, he possessed ability to live with men. And as a man, he revealed to them their creator and also freed them from the bondage of sin. Praise God. Next week, we'll get into the redemption. Praise the Lord. Let's go over our questions real quick. We got, we got to get you um, through here. Uh, explain Galatians 4.4. 4. And um, we really didn't read Galatians 4.4, 4, so maybe it would do us um, good to explain what we are explaining. Hebrew, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time was come, Christ, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So it was talking about the fullness of time. And here we go. Because, of the, because the Greeks had given us the most expansive, expressive worldwide language, and the Romans had united the world under one government where relative peace prevailed and had built roads on the major trade routes of the world. It aided in the spreading of the gospel. Thus, the fullness of times, it was right and the best time for Jesus to come. How does history reveal that ancient man hungered for incarnation? And history reveals that to us and shows us that all ancient people had drank blood of sacrificial victims in seeking oneness with God. And does man today still seek for an incarnation? The answer is yes. Modern religion, men who claim incarnation, and cultic teaching that man is divine all point to the fact that humanity is still seeking for the incarnation to be reconciled to God. But why had man no true conception of God? Man had no true conception of God um, because he had rejected revelation. The blindness had overtaken the minds of men and they lost the true conception of God. In John 1, 18, the Gospel of John reads, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, uh, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And explain that, Jesus took, the, took pleasure in revealing the true nature of God to humanity. He came to fully represent him in all of his goodness to us. And what effect did the life of Christ have upon the childhood 
and the womanhood of the world. His life and teachings elevated children and women to the rightful place of value in society. And only where the true gospel is not preached are they lessened. Are they demeaned? How do we know that God is love? We know that God is love by observing the life of Jesus, who is a representation of God. And how did Christ reveal God as a father God? He revealed him as a father God by referring to him as father. And why did disease and death have no power over the body of Jesus? They had no power over the body of Jesus because disease was a child of spiritual death and spiritual death had never entered the spirit of Christ. Thus, he was not subject to spiritual death's effects and authority. And why was Christ as a man independent of Satan? Because Jesus was not spiritually dead, thus not subject to Satan in any arena. That's why Satan worked so hard to try to get Jesus to bow to him and submit to him so that he would have authority over him. Hallelujah. Hope you enjoyed this tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and receive our weekly Wednesday night offering. Uh, you may use PayPal, uh, Cash App, uh, any other means. You can use snail mail. Um, again, uh, message us and we will send you an address if you need to mail um, offerings to the church. If you prefer to do it that way, that's we're, we're quite fine with that. Um, praise the Lord. The word of God says that we're to give and it shall be given unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and then we'll give unto our bosom. And so we're thankful to God for his covenant promises in relationship to giving. And we thank you for being obedient to God and God will honor and bless you because of that obedience. Father, we pray over the people now. Uh, first of all, that revelation, understanding, wisdom, and light comes from the things shared tonight. Their spirits are enhanced and their spiritual walk with you is enhanced. And Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that as they sow their tithe and offerings, that heaven's windows are open unto them and you empty out of them blessings they do not have room enough to receive. We decree it and declare it as so in the majestic and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Well, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. We're so happy to have you. Don't forget, Sunday morning at 1030, we'll be back. We will be virtual this week. Um, and we're, we're trusting this is our last su virtual Sunday. And now in the future, if we have a snowstorm or something like that, it's nice to know that we can set up and go virtual um, and, you know, still have church and not have to miss completely. But um, we're moving back into a regular uh church flow of, of uh, live services in person all the time. Um, we had been but meeting at somebody else's place. That's about to come to a close and uh, we'll have a regular meeting place. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, until we see, we see you on Sunday, uh, may the Lord bless you. We thank God's favors upon you. And we want to remind you of these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online. Good night, everybody.